guys, it's X. Welcome back to my channel. In today's video, we are going to be discussing propofol. So if you want to learn more about it, just keep on watching. But before you swipe me away or click me on this video, please like, comment, and don't forget to hit the subscribe button. Thank you. Okay, so what is there to know about propofol? Also known as diprovan, or some people like to call it milk of amnesia because that is a side effect. It does cause retrograde amnesia, meaning that when you give it, they the patients won't remember like the couple minutes beforehand or after or during. But that can be debatable because some patients do remember being on the ventilator in specific events. But anyway, um, the concentration of diprovan, propofol, whatever you want to call it, is 1000 milligrams per 100 ml vial. It is a lipid-based um, formula. That is why it is white. Uh, so with that, you want to make sure that you are changing your IV tubing every 12 hours because bacteria loves to grow in there. And if it's running through a central line, you definitely don't want to have to change that central line or risk the patient getting a clabsy. So you definitely want to be very careful with propofol because of that um, reason. So make sure you are changing it. It is a weight-based dosed medication so it is micrograms per kilogram per minute so depending on how heavy your patient is you can have one bottle of propofol for the whole day or you can be changing it every two hours depending on how high your propofol is and how fast it's running um, and how much the patient weighs because it is weight based Propofol has side effects of respiratory depression, propofol infusion syndrome. It also causes green urine in some people with a metabolite. It raises your triglycerides. So let's break that down a couple bit for, for you. Um, so you definitely want to change your IV tubing every 12 hours because bacteria likes to grow in there. So definitely mark your line um, and let the next nurse know like when your tubing expires because you don't want to cause the patient to have a blood stream infection um over propofol uh it can cause green urine so i don't think that's a side effect that a lot of people know and it definitely doesn't happen to everybody you can have a patient that is on it for 24 hours and immediately like after that 24 hours their urine is green you can start knowing that it's like what is that like <laughs> i remember i saw um a foley catheter that had green substance in it and i was like is that the foley are they on propofol or is that their like g-tube to gravity <laughs> um i was showing a student so that is definitely a side effect that you want to know it is a metabolite in the urine that causes it so it doesn't happen to everybody i've had patients be on it for three four days straight and you don't get green urine and then there's some people that are on it and within a few hours their urine is green hypertriglyceride triglyceridemia is another thing that you want to look out for so there are some facilities that will have you check triglycerides every 24 hours and then there are some facilities that will spot check it once a week um, but it is definitely something that you want to be mindful of and be aware of i was taught by one facility and i have asked so many nurses this and nobody else seems to know this so i'm not sure how true this is but i was told that when you fatten up the cell so much and that's why we check triglycerides that you can cause if the cell ruptures a burst of potassium and that can cause the heart to have arrhythmias or stop i don't know how true that is that is definitely something that i was taught but no other nurse seems to know that when i've asked and if you think about it if you have a trauma patient and they get crushed one thing that they have is hyperkalemia because the crush the crush injury causes the potassium to shift out of the cells and if that is possible, then I would, wouldn't they get that burst of potassium? So I'm not true. I'm not sure how true that one detail is about the triglycerides and that's why we check it, but it definitely, you don't want your patient to have high triglycerides. So, um, if that is something, it depends on their like, um, diagnosis like if you have someone that has high icps or status epilepticus like you have to outweigh the balance like is this more is their high triglycerides more important than what is going on in the brain probably not so it would be up to the doctor to decide let me see another side effect is propofol infusion syndrome <laughs> propofol infusion syndrome sorry i can't speak today so with pro propofol infusion syndrome there is bradycardia metabolic acidosis um the patient can get rhabdomyelitis uh myelitis 
rhabdomyolysis rem <laughs> rhabdomyolysis you guys i can never pronounce that word um so you want to check and make sure that their urine is not a, like a dark orange um dark brown color like that might be a sign a symptom of it i will never forget one time i was talking to a doctor and i was like hey i noticed that the uh urine is green do you want me to switch to Versed? and he's like what like what are you talking about why do you think that propofol is causing this to be like the urine to be green and i was like i was always taught that like am i crazy i literally sat there like thinking about my whole nursing career because i was like what do you mean like am i thinking the wrong thing am i thinking methylene blue like wait a minute no i know for sure propofol causes green urine so i was like a little taken back that the doctor didn't know that but then i realized like they're not at the bedside 24 7. <laughs> so he was like i was like I was always taught this is a sign of propofol infusion syndrome and he's like the patient's not bradycardic they're not acidotic and I was like whoa 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 okay like okay <laughs> I get it like we'll stay on the propofol so then it turns out that it is not a sign of propofol infusion syndrome it is just the metabolite in the urine that causes it to be green so just because you have green urine doesn't mean you're in propofol infusion syndrome it just means it's a metabolite that caused that transition so I <laughs> definitely learned my lesson and I will never forget the signs and symptoms of propofol infusion syndrome because he yelled them <laughs> out when he was talking to me um so basically the way we titrate uh propofol is by five mics every i believe five to ten minutes depending on your facility so what that means is we titrate usually to a ras so what ras stands for is richmond agitation sedation scale and it is i believe um i know up to negative five and i think positive five i don't really know the so zero is like alert and calm. Negative one is drowsy. Negative two is light sedation, meaning you can like say, hey, Mr. Jones, how are you doing? And they'll like briefly wake up, look at you and fall right back to sleep. That is where most people want your negative um, RAS score to be is negative two. Negative five is unarousable. Negative um, four is... Uh, deep sedation and then negative three is moderate sedation so unless the patient has like ards or is on a severe like high setting or they are getting ttm like you usually don't aim to have them so knocked out that they're like negative four negative five um, you usually want them the goal of the sedation is just to keep them comfortable it's not to like snow them and knock them out so with that you have to assess every hour like how sleepy and sedated the patient is another side effect of propofol is that it decreases one your respiratory um drive that's why you have to be on a ventilator and not on a spontaneous setting you know, like a cpap or pressure support it also causes um hypotension so be mindful of that if your patient is not on pressors and on um sedation like that might be a reason to you don't want to have to start vasopressors because you're um having the sedation too high you can lower it i mean depending on the situation and like what is going on you might have to start pressors so like on ttm you have them so sedated there's so many things going on with ttm but like that is one thing that you do want to be mindful of is the side effects of your medication for any icu drug i would suggest knowing every single side effect so that you know what is going on that is gonna help you tremendously in your icu career is that you have to know the signs symptoms and side effects of each medication so like with propofol infusion syndrome if you start noticing that the patient is bradycardic and they're a little acidotic and you don't have another reason for it like that might be um a good time to bring it up to the doctor like hey we might need to switch sedation um, okay so let's talk about um titration and maxing propofol is very weird for many different people like there are some people that you can put five mics and they are knocked out and there are some people you can have on 50 mics and they are thrashing like crazy so the concentration like i said is a thousand milligrams uh, milligrams in um 
100 mls so we titrate by mics per kilogram per minute so some hospitals that i have been to i have seen a max of propofol of 50 mics per kilogram per minute or 60 and up to 75 75 i think is the highest i've ever seen um so you can use propofol for sedation you can use it for status epilepticus and you can use it to decrease icp so if your patient has a traumatic brain injury and you don't want them to herniate like that is a definitely a medication that you can use it helps um with seizures and it also um obviously we use it to sedate people when they're on a vent because it is uncomfortable like i've always heard that intubation like being on a ventilator feels like you're breathing through a straw you have a tube down your throat you're just uncomfortable so those are things that we use. I would always, 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 no matter what, have patients still restrained, even if they're sedated, unless their um, clinical like outcome is not so good. Like that's when I see that people are um, not restrained on ventilators, but usually majority of the time they are. If they are on TTM and you have them or you have them paralyzed, like I don't see people with restraints, but I definitely would rather chart restraints than to have that patient accidentally wake up and pull that tube. That is a very, very, very bad day. So you don't want to do that. Um, so let's talk about the RAS a little bit more. So you want to assess your patient every hour. I'm assuming every ICU patient is going to have a Q1 hour neuro checks, Q2 hour neuro checks. That's the perfect time when you do your neuro checks to go in and um, assess the RAS score. So basically, how do you come up? How do you come down? So if the patient is obviously a RAS of negative one or two, we're going to stay where we're at. So whether that is 10 mics, 15 mics, if they're bucking the vent, meaning they're not synchronizing with the vent, you might want to go up on your propofol or on your fentanyl, depending on what else uh, you have. Usually fentanyl and propofol are hand in hand when a patient is on a ventilator. So if you see that your patient is comfortable, they're not fighting the ventilator, they're RAS negative two, you can stay at the setting that you are at. But if you see that the patient is starting to thrash, starting to pull, they're fighting the ventilator, then it's okay. Obviously you go to your RAS score, you chart what you see and you go up by your five mics. If you see that it's been a few hours and the patient is comfortable and they are not fighting they're not easily waking up chart your ass see where they're at and then you can titrate down also when you are on a ventilator you um do what's called spontaneous awakening trials spontaneous breathing trials so every day usually around 7 a.m depending on the facility i think i used to do this at 4 a.m when i was at a previous facility but we would turn all the sedation off see how the patient responded, see how they reacted, and then basically put them on a spontaneous breathing mode. Make sure your IV is flushed before this. Disconnect the sedation if you have to, but just make sure you're not pushing um, the propofol if you have it in your IV still. So now, before any time I do a spontaneous breathing trial, I make sure to disconnect the sedation line, flush that IV, and then go to my spontaneous um, breathing trial because I don't want to compromise the extubation by making them too sleepy before the doctor is ready to pull a tube. So that is another thing that we do every day with propofol and fentanyl. If they're on a vent, you turn off the sedation, see how the patient does. They breathing on their own for a few hours. Um, we get another arterial blood gas, see how they're doing. And if they're ready to extubation, then yay, we're ready to extubate. <laughs> it's always a good day uh, when we extubate a patient. So I think that is all I have for you guys today. I don't know if I missed anything. If you have any questions about propofol, leave them down below. If I missed anything or have any corrections, please let me know. And thank you guys. Have a good day. Bye.